proud to present this on behalf of uh, UKAA, BPF, CREFC as part of the Property Initi um, Alliance initiative. Um, we are here to launch uh, the BTR hub um, and talk about building a brighter future. Um, and it's with pleasure that I welcome fabulous guests uh, to present and um, our wonderful panel. I'll start with Ian Fletcher. Um, of the BPF, uh, Director of Policy. Ian, you are known to many far and wide. Uh, you do a fantastic job um, on behalf of the residential sector um, for property. Um, you were a member of the government Montague Review and helped the government to review the case for protecting client money, as well as chairing the regulation for student accommodation. Uh, you sit on the Affordable Housing Commission and you're an honorary fellow of IRPM and of the RSA and um, uh, do so much fabulous work. And Ian is going to do a bit of a presentation for us after the introductions of the panel and the, um, the hub. And then we're going to go into a Q&A session with um, Mark Davis of um, um, Deputy Director of Housing Investment and Diversification at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Um, that's certainly not a mouthful, Mark. Um, you're responsible uh, for policy on the building on build to rent sector, um, small medium house builders, modern methods of construction, um, community led housing and other forms of housing that can help diversify the housing market. Um, you've been involved um, in numerous things and I've known you for a long time. You've always such a pragmatic um, and sage uh, interface with the government and represent the sector extremely well. Um, it's a pleasure to have you and we're looking forward to hearing your views and what's happening in the government. Um, next we have Peter Sloan, who's the Chair of Love to Rent. Hands up, Peter. Um, long sector um, uh, experience has Peter in residential um, developed marketing in the housing sector um, and worked for some big names in the industry, so like Knight Frank and Savills and currently the Chair of Love to Rent and which is a unique portal, uh, specifically marketing high quality build to rent properties. And we'll be speaking to us today on behalf of sort of the consumer side of things and what's happening on the cold face of, of, um, uh, of the customer. And next we've got um, Darren Shota. Is that how I pronounce it, Darren? It's close, Sahota. Sahota, apologies. Very good, um, it's okay. The director at Barclays Corporate Bank, and you're responsible for sourcing and delivering real estate um, debt opportunities above greater than 10 million. Um, and you work with a range of clients from listed REITs to family offices and all subsectors of the real estate. And you will be coming to us from, um, from the perspective of the lending side, um, which is really important, obviously, and um, liquidity of the market and so forth. And then we've got Joe. Joe, perhaps you can say your surname so I don't get it wrong. <laughs> it's Sahota. No, sorry, it's it's <laughs> Persichino. <laughs> I don't know if I would have got that one right. So thank you very much. Um, from AXA Investment and fantastic um, advertisement there on the, on the uh, corporate side behind you. Um, head of residential and student accommodation um, for AXA IM and uh, the real asset side. Uh, you're responsible for uh, strategy, assisting deal orientation and advising on investments. So, um, and you've worked internationally and your role is currently global. So Joe, it comes to us with the perspective of looking at um, investment and uh, certainly interesting from a global perspective as well. Um, so I just wanted to note that Peter is a, um, uh, is a substitute for Anne-Marie who unfortunately couldn't make it today and um, we are sorry that she couldn't but Peter is a, uh, a stand-in, not nearly as attractive unfortunately but uh, we welcome you anyway Peter. <laughs> so we're here today to talk about the Build to Rent Hub um, and the launch. So um, what is it? What does it do for us? Um, and who contributes to it. Um, Ian, do you want to give a brief overview? Leslie, thank you. I'll, I'll do a brief overview. And um, I might at this point, um, I'm going to tempt fate and try to share my screen. Uh, uh, the Built Rent Hub was um, something that uh, uh, Dave Butler at UKA and Peter uh, Keane. Right, okay. 
it's sharing then and just um, talk about it and uh, people can uh, look at www.builttorent.info. And uh, as I was saying, this is an idea that um, myself, Peter and Dave um, had wanted to pursue, uh, supported by the Property Industry Alliance. Um, a, few, a few thank yous to start off with. Um, uh, firstly, to Dave and uh, to Peter for providing some of the content, particularly on the operational side and the financial side. And to Florence, uh, my colleague who put the site together. And then also to a number of members who have uh, helped us populate it uh, with uh, pictures of Bill Torrent, um, obviously brought it to life um, significantly through, through their help. Uh, the idea was to, I suppose, reach out to particularly three audiences. So, um, so myself and no doubt many others on the call get a lot of queries from the media about Bill Torrent and uh, providing them with some basic information on it. Um, other key stakeholders that we were wanting to target the site with were uh, firstly would-be investors. Um, certainly we still get quite a lot of uh, particularly overseas investors that want to know more about uh, British Bill Torrent. And then uh, thirdly was um, government stakeholders, uh, not so much central government, but, but local government and local planners, local uh, planning committee members um, who are coming across Bill Torrent for the first time and need to know more about it. Uh, so the site really seeks to appeal to them. It um, has sort of two sort of branches, two directories that sort of come off the, the main uh, page. Um, what we'd not wanted to do, and, and we didn't feel we were in the best position to do, was to create a, a website for consumers. Um, as we'll hear in a moment, um, you know, there are far better, um, I think, consumer-orientated websites out there. Uh, so we were conscious, however, that consumers may, may come onto the site. And so there is a sort of small section which uh, uh, gives them a little bit of background about Build to Rent. Uh, they can see the developments by linking through to our Build to Rent map. Uh, lots of nice uh, sort of gallery of pictures of built to rent and uh, uh, also links through to the government's um, how to rent guide. We were sort of conscious that um, we wanted to be responsible and if somebody was uh, thinking about renting for the first time, um, we should point them in the direction of some some advice that would help them uh, you know, get a good contract in that respect. So that's all signposted but but the main brunt of the site is uh, focused on those three key audiences and is meant to bring together you know there's, there's a heck of a lot of really good information out there um, that people have pulled together on build to rent research that's been done uh, guidance from government um, uh, data provision from various providers and um, at the moment, it's just scattered across the internet. So the primary purpose of the hub is to try, we've sort of organized it into different sort of categories. So there's a, a general introduction. Uh, there's a focus on the sort of planning side. There's a focus on the, the financing side and you know, great, great to have uh, Darren on the, on the call today. Uh, there's a, a focus on the operational side, focus on data. Um, events so that people can see the various other um, events that are going on within the sector. You know, I think one of the great things about Build to Rent has been that there has been that that collaboration we've seen over the last few years and you know, people are prepared to share things, want to be able to um, you know, provide that information to others and share it and um, you know, that, that's what we've tried to do on the site. And then there's a sort of a general inquiries uh, section as well. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah clearly a moving part, and yeah, very much welcome. Yeah, you know, we've got 159 people on this call. Um, yeah, if they've come across particular guidelines find really useful, um, you yeah, know, then please get in touch with me. Commercial um, uh, documents. So, um, it but if it's uh, has has a sort of an air of independence, and uh, um, yeah, people find it particularly useful in terms of being able to you know, go through the process of. Uh, developing build to end, managing it, um, investing in it, then uh, desperately keen to hear from you. So, so that, that sort of concludes my, my first part. The, the, the second part, and again, I was going to share my screen, but I won't, um, was just to give a very quick update on our, our build to rent statistics, uh, which were issued yesterday uh, for quarter three. 
And all I've done on that is to pull out what I think are sort of five, five headline stats, um, conscious we want to get into, uh, into the chat and, and um, hear from our August panelists. So I'm going to keep this very brief, um, but um, the five headlines I'll just sort of rattle off. The, the first was that um, uh, the Bill Trent pipe, pipeline, and I should say you know, a, a great deal of thanks to Savills and Molia who you know, do all the hard work on this. Um, you know, we, we, we publish it in our name, but it's, uh, it's very much them that, that keep the, oils, uh, the, the wheels oiled on this and uh, do a lot of the hard work on it. Um, so pipeline 172,000 units. Um, year on year, uh, that is 20% up on 2019, quarter three. Um, uh, an increase of about 7,000 units over the, the quarter from quarter two to quarter three. Um, most interesting stat, I think, from this uh, set of statistics is that for the first time we've, we've broken through the the 50,000 in terms of units that are complete. And um, yeah, that's been evident over the last couple of years and there's, there's a evident by the people on this call today that um, yeah, the sector is increasingly going operational uh, for the British public, 50K for the first time. The, the third stat is that um, uh, regional growth has been um, really sort of accelerating rapidly over the last year or so. Uh, so the regions now, um, we're up to, I think it's uh, London 77k of that 172, whereas the region's 95k. Uh, year on year growth in London, 6%. Year on year growth in the region's 34%. And if you go on to map, you sort of see, see that, that... Uh, yeah, the sectors reached out from sort of uh, down out of London uh, out to the core cities, but increasingly you're seeing you know, built to rent nationwide and places like not too many no go areas, I don't think, for built to rent now. Um, fourthly, just that. Um, uh, We've seen the sector be quite quite robust in Q3. Uh, there was a bit of a blip in Q2, uh, a natural consequence of of the pandemic, uh, but it has recovered quite strongly. So Q3, 11 schemes completed 1,500 units, uh, 10 schemes started 2,800 units, and 17 schemes got uh, detailed planning permission 4,800 units. So um, yeah, good good activity out there. Perhaps some of it is sort of almost being deferred from Q2 to Q3, uh, so we won't perhaps see how that sort of trend has, has sort of been affected until Q4. Um, so a note of caution there, but nevertheless, given the circumstances that we've all lived in over the last six months, to see that pipeline continuing robustly, I think, is is very. Um, I would have liked to have shown you this one, but um, it was the last slide in the pack, which you can see on our website. Um, it was just, um, I suppose, a statistical point, which is that uh, we've been trying to uh, improve the sort of transparency of the stats. And one of the ways that we're doing that is to start publishing. Um, these, are, these are very much sort of real time stats, but trying to pluck out schemes that have sort of um, almost sort of hit a brick wall in terms of being withdrawn or refused. Um, and uh, uh, that constitutes about 5,000 units within the pipeline. Um, you know, often those schemes come back again. Um, you know, if they're refused, people will put in another application. Um, clearly if they're withdrawn, sometimes they get the, they end up in the hands of another investor. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, we've tried to provide those stats going forward and uh, they're reflected in the, the last slide on the slide pack. So, sorry I couldn't show you pretty pictures, um, but hopefully that, that gives a, a roundup of what I was gonna talk about. So, thanks Ian, and will the, will be the slides be either circulated to the panel, uh, sorry, to the to the audience here today or on available on the website directly thereafter? They're on the BBF website, but I'm sure we can follow up with the link as well. Honestly, and do, do that. We'll also um, include the, uh, the web address. Fabulous. 
Um, uh, so thank you very much. That's really um, insightful. Um, one of the biggest things I picked out of that is the growth of the regions of 34% versus London at 6% being um, year on year. That's a phenomenal um, statistic and, um, and good news, obviously, for the regions. Um, London has a lot of investment. Obviously, the Polo Mint kind of scenario that's going on at the moment may not be such good news, uh, but we'll see uh, in the next discussion about how we are going to help um, build a better, uh, brighter future. Um, so I'm going to open up um, a Q&A session now with the panel. Um, and the theme for today is about building a brighter future. And I'm keen to discuss what are the parallels between the function of the hub, seeing as we're launching it today, and really happy about that. And again, thank you for all the contributors to that. Um, and building a brighter build to rent future. So a bit of insight from our sector specialists on the importance of understanding build to rent insight and, and learning about what they don't know or what's important to them. Um, so let's start with Mark on government. Um, sector success, you know, what's next for government? We've come a long way since the task force, uh, the establishment of the BPF Build to Rent Committee, the UKAA, and the extensive involvement in shaping the sector that they've had, CREFC's leading role in supporting and promoting Build to Rent finance. We're still committed to building this brighter future. What is um, central government's role going forward in, in this scenario, do you think? Um, so it's tremendously encouraging. I mean, the, the way I look at it actually is quite often is what is the rolling uh, 12 months completions in the sector? And, you know, this is a sector that's now delivering 10,000 homes per year completions, basically. Um, and I'm not sure that when it all got going back in, or sorry, got going, but when government started taking an interest in 2012, we necessarily had a particular view of what that that what success looked like. And I know that some such as Savills have quoted figures, I think in the past of maybe reaching 15,000 per year, but still, you know, this is now becoming, we, as we understand it, um, a somewhat established as an asset class um, and beginning to, to, it is beginning to, it is making a difference to housing numbers. Um, it is becoming established. And I'm sure we'll hear from the investors later about uh, real estate investors' appetite to invest in resi at a time when other asset classes are performing less less well. So, so that's brilliant. I think what probably comes with build to rent establishing itself as an asset class and becoming a deliverer is that, ironically, you might hear us talk less about it um and and do less that is less specific build to rent policy so we did have a task force we did have a, a, we do have actually a prs guarantee scheme we have the build to rent fund we are less actively developing new policy for build to rent right here right now because it is part of the housing delivery market so i think one of the things government's role is first of all to create an economic economic climate in which the sector can deliver along with all other sectors of the economy. Secondly, to, um, to create a housing delivery market that works and clearly the big thing going on at the moment that has medium and long-term consequences is the planning reforms uh, to simplify the system, both at plan making and getting consents doesn't say a huge amount about build to rent in the planning white paper there is actually one specific question and it is worth engaging with and it is worth answering that question which is about on-site affordable housing but it's creating a broad canvas and the detail will need to be filled in over time i guess the other thing government can do and partly what my job is while we're less active developing specific policy on build to rent is just making sure we don't inadvertently introduce policies that get in the way um, we you, you know i've heard various views expressed over the last few years about policies that have made build to rent more difficult be that stamp duty uh, land tax changes or whatever there will always be tensions with other policy objectives um, but we don't want to to do those things inadvertently and finally, we're, we're keeping a watching eye, seeing, you know, we think things are working well at the moment, but if specific policy interventions are needed over time, then, then we're here to keep an eye on that. 
so I think I think that's broadly where we are. But government does recognise the benefits of this sector, and we want to see those benefits realised and the sector flourish. Um, thanks, Mark. I mean, build to rent is is um, well is build to rent countercyclical, and considering our current environment, is that what making is making it you know look particularly good? And and how important is that to the government right now in terms of how it fits in with the house builder models and the construction? Industry. So, so I think from our perspective, we will only really be able to say when you've been through a cycle and seen how, how it's performed. So um, I tried to describe it as being less pro-cyclical than the build for sale market. Um, that There are good fundamental reasons why that ought to be true, just both, both in the way of the way rental levels um, behave relative to house prices, but also how transactions hold up. And actually, the more transactions you have, the more opportunities there are for people to move from the regular buy to let sector into the build to rent sector. So transaction volume counts too. So, so there's good reasons why the fundamentals should be less pro-cyclical. We won't overstate that until such time as we've really seen it happen. Um, I think we saw a couple of years ago that, you know, sometimes there are confounding factors and other things that happen at the same time as a doubt. You can experience a bit of downturn that can get in the way of that. But it is important. Um, we want diversity. We want resilience uh, across the cycle. And we think the build to rent sector can help that as well as other objectives such as experience living experience of the people who live in that accommodation actually really interested in the geography um and and you know maybe this can be part of the town center regeneration uh, agenda and indeed the leveling up agenda as we see uh, build to rent spread out so it's not only about uh, counter cyclicality but yes that does that that message does land okay and and just going to go over to the investment side on this particular topic about Counter cyclical nature of build to rent, and um, so from from Axe's point of view, and, and Darren, I might come to you as well on this. Is that and, and Mark mentioned a few things in there in terms of the diversity of housing, the living experience, the geography, and so forth. But in terms of the, is that something from an investment point of view, Joe, that that Axe and, and yourself look at in terms of how important that is um, to to what's happening in the obviously in the in the wider housing market, or is it just more about additionality at the moment and the fundamentals of supply and demand and of course there's a global pandemic on top of that to mark's point about you know you like to see a cycle going through at this point i'm not quite sure how long that cycle might last i don't think we've ever been through this before so a couple of exactly, quite exactly. Questions. <clears throat> well mark mark hit the nail on the head there in terms of diversification and resilience so residential as a whole is very resilient i think it's probably the leading two sectors that's performing during this pandemic, along with logistics, you know, across our portfolio, we've seen strong collection rates above 96%. So again, good long dated income stream, which is ideal for what we're looking for, for this type of strategy for a residential strategy. Yeah. Um, we've obviously looked to diversify. So within our portfolio, for example, we don't just have BTR product, we'll have traditional um, PRS, but student some co-living um, whatever is suitable for that market and I mean it was interesting to hear the stats in terms of the, the, the regional versus London which probably won't be a surprise in terms of the trickiness of getting into London but certainly the, the growth in the regions now for us I think it's there's something to keep an eye on <clears throat> going forward because we it, it will be it that residential so far has proved to be counter cyclical I think I think what we're looking for, looking at specifically is what are governments, local governments going to do, the, the government in general, um, how is unemployment going to play out going forward, which could have an impact on certain schemes, uh, certain price points and rental levels across the country. So that, that will be the, the true test, but um, that's still to come down the line for us. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's the big unknown about how long is this cycle lasting and will it look like anything we've ever seen before? So, Darren, from your perspective, you know, you did the lending on this sort of stuff and you obviously have to be comfortable with the investment side of it. And no doubt Joe and his team put forward a very persuasive argument. Um, how important is the sort of the 
counter cyclical nature of of this asset for you do you think that when we come out of this or it changes again that's of a concern or is it I have a lot of what Joe said. I think the the term banded around right now is beds and sheds. That seems to be flavor of the month. But if we think about it from a practical perspective for the bank, um, you know, we similarly view residential as quite defensive. Um, and then if we look at you know relaying some of the stats that Ian's just 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 told us about, I think it demonstrates that the build to rent sector has evolved and has moved to a place now where you know, more and more banks will start to be able to get comfortable with this because originally it was, well, we need this asset class to prove up. Um, I think you know, as these stats become more positive, as we start to see occupancy levels, that helps us underwrite our business case back from a credit perspective, but in an asset class that we do view as quite defensive considering what's going on um, macroeconomically i guess with 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 everything else that we're facing at the minute so yeah i think certainly there's been a renewed focus internally within the bank um towards residential um development and and investment itself as well and is that i'm curious if that's more defensive because other asset areas are not doing so well or because built to rent is attractive in its own right so is it, or is it a bit I, think, I, think it's, I think it's attractive in its own right, but I think you know, the statistics speak for themselves in terms of rental collections, for example. So if we look at real estate and we break out the different asset classes, we have a quite right, wide ranging book, whether it's student accommodation, retail, logistics, residential investment. And if you look at our residential investment statistics, typically you're collecting greater than sort of 90 percent of the rental income across any given portfolio. Um, we expect that to continue. Ultimately, people need somewhere to live. So, you know, as long as things have been pitched at the right level um, in the right areas, we're not expecting you know, drastic um, decreases, for example, in rental tone either. I think where we have seen that be a bit more prominent is in holiday lets, for example, in London. One of my clients here has that type of portfolio, but they've just had to adjust um, accordingly. But certainly in build to rent, you know, I don't think we're forecasting um, significant drops, but I guess this goes back to the underwrite thesis as well. And we'll probably get into this later on in terms of how we actually finance these things. It's one of the main reasons why from the outset, when we looked at these types of schemes, which may have had a two, three year development pipeline, we wouldn't necessarily attribute the two or 3% growth in the investor model when we were underwriting something um, that you know they were putting into their model. So, for us, again, that's been another thing that's been quite helpful in terms of what we've already financed and equally, you know, what we're looking to finance in the future as well. Um, thanks, Darren. I mean, it's been really, I'm going to come on to the sort of the consumer bit now. So, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, so to speak, as, because as a sector, we're really good at um, B2B um, and sector engagement, I feel. Um, we've got good collaboration between the industry bodies. You know, the hub is a great example of how we're sharing information um, um, and wanting to sort of understand each other's different perspective. And individually as companies, there are really many successful marketing campaigns for the, for the B2C market um, and development. So Get Living, Moda, APA, APO, more, more Fields More, um, uh, Tippy and Quintain are really good examples. But Collectively, we're not particularly great or actively engaged in working together for the consumer awareness as a differentiated product um, of differentiation for the end user, you know, enter stage left, someone like uh, Love to Rent. Um, and Ian said, you know, we do have a consumer tab on this, on this hub, which is a sort of a nod to the fact that actually there is a pretty big stakeholder in this, in this, in this whole sector that we haven't quite joined the dots. I think I'm curious about where to from here in that, you know, if we're building a better future, I don't think that this is something that we should ignore. In fact, I think it's something we should actively engage in. Peter, I'm interested in your perspective on this. And then going back to you, Darren, about how the investment lending side, Joe, you as well, how they perceive the consumer trends and so forth. So over to you, Peter. Yeah. Thanks, Leslie. Um, well, Love Trent was set up and Anne-Marie um, approached me to, to join her some years ago when she looked at this. And it was, it was clear that the emerging built remote market didn't have 
a platform uh, search engine that was that was aimed at it, and um, that's where Love Great came in. And immediately, as it came became live and gathered all of the big developers you've spoken about who are um, very active in in the industry, we uh, we also had a seen a big increase, especially over the last um, pandemic period of consumer activity on site. And um, one of the big things that I think is sort of identifies the point you've made is the number of consumers and people interested in coming into rent who have asked about bringing their pets in. And the joyous response to that is the number of developers who welcome pets into homes, which is the complete antithesis of perhaps the established private PRS market where an AST typically four or five points down in, in the schedule says no pets. So it's a barrier and trying to separate the Brits from their pets is, is not a very nice thing to do. It's like leaving the children outside when, when you go in and somewhere nice and warm. Some might say that's not such a bad thing, but um, so it's, it's a pleasure to see that. And I think what we'll see in the built environment is developers latching on to that because it will attract more residents and uh, perhaps provide pet friendly spaces in the communal areas, little kennels perhaps, or scrubbing brushes or mats to clean the little paws when they've come in from a dirty walk. Um, and it shows that what it shows, I think mostly to us is the product has been built to provide homes for longevity. It's not just a space that you can stay in, but it isn't yours and make no mistake, it's not yours, you're just renting. So the, the, the mode of, of uh, and, and others, clients of ours, have, have produced some wonderful community-based, encouraging and exciting um, experiences for their residents during lockdown, exercise regimes on the, on the lofts or on balconies and things like that. And I think they're very mindful in the um, resident management arena of appealing to their customer, perhaps as, certainly as much as the private build sector. So we're encouraged by that. It's interesting, the, you know, this whole, you know, bark parks and pooch parlors and Prosecco parties and so forth is, is, a, is a really big thing. And, and myself I run an operational company and we do a lot of this stuff. It's, it, it's powerful. And what, what is interesting is how that is starting to feed back into the investment models about how the power of the consumer and actually what, what listening to them. And Darren, I'm interested to hear from a lending perspective, and I'm, I'll go to you, Joey, again, but from a lending perspective, how much do you look into this sort of data around the profile of, um, you know, the demographics behind who lives in these apartments, what they need? Is that something you look at in terms of your viability and, and um, you know, stress tests from Joe's model, let's say? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you think about the two component parts of it, there's the one, you know, the numbers, and then the other side of it is the operational strategy and the business case that's attached to the specific scheme that we're looking at. Um, I think, you know, we learned a lot of this through our experience in lending into student accommodation in the early stages, where one of the key tenants for us was, you know, the operational strategy is probably if not more critical than the numbers themselves, you know, a very important part of our, our thought process in terms of lending. And you know, I think that's you know, rightly one of the areas where we've, where we've really struggled in terms of being able to unlock finance, for example, where you know, there's a full service offering and you're trying to get comfortable with premium. What, what that difference between rent um, actually is on a market perspective versus that premium that you're paying for the build to rent offering. Um, and you know, that's where we have done some work in terms of you know, if there's statistics available or if there's anecdotal evidence that's available to us that helps us prove some of those things, I think then it feeds into making that underwrite process much easier. You know, this is where when the asset class was in its infancy and people were thinking, right, this is what people want or this is what people need, it's very hard to be able to go and just say, well, we think this or we know this based on a, you know, a focus group of 10 to 15 people. Now that we're starting to get some set scale in the sector, now that we're starting to see you know, people actually paying the rents that 
um, operators are asking, um, it's much easier then to be able to put that lens to that operational strategy and say, actually, they were able to prove it in X asset, wherever in the country we're talking about. So now maybe we think that they can do that in the next location that they're looking to build their assets. So I certainly think, you know, it's one of the areas that all of us as an industry group need to, I think, become much better at is, you know, sharing data, making sure that we're all a little bit more comfortable, but, you know, consumer sentiment is, is very important to us in terms of, you know, making sure that we're underwriting the right product for the right location, um, you know, for the right price point. Thanks, Darren. And Joe, you know, that, that, that data, how much do you rely on hard data and where do you get it from, if so? And, um, and how much of it do you sort of like think, actually, I just know this, this is going to work? Or is it the likes of Peter, Peter and his stats saying, no, it absolutely works because here's the X, Y, Z? <laughs> Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I suppose we've got the advantage of, of having a global portfolio, so therefore we're forever learning, trying, testing out new things and, and have the ability to do so. Um, I think there was a danger when the, the sector was first born, if you like, um, that it was a, a cut and paste from, from the States, which I think everyone will attest to doesn't, isn't right and doesn't work. However, when you had nothing to go off of, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Let's put something in. I think we've got the benefit of hindsight now and foresight uh, in terms of these new schemes and, and what's gone on. And I think there, there's certainly, you know, from an investor perspective, real estate is more operational. It's not just bricks and mortar anymore, albeit it's a very important part, capital values, etc. It's It's getting these buildings full at the right rental levels and having happy customers that or residents that stay there for you know, year after year. So therefore, it's very important that what you're putting into these assets appeals to them. You know, I think in the first few schemes, everyone just said, it's guaranteed, you have to have a gym, you have to have a, a cinema room, um, maybe a, a dining room, kitchen that's bookable. We have now see that's changed. And yes, trends come and go. And there are certain fads, but others will, will stay. We're seeing you know, the pandemic's bringing co-working to the fore even more. If you have to be at home, then you need a space outside of the four walls that you're living in, in your apartment. So therefore, how does that fit, fit into build to rent going forward? And how much space should you dedicate? And I think there's a balance between the, the, the amenities and the services. And, you know, and Darren will probably attest to this, that you've still got to make the numbers work at the end of the day. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to be really sure about the leakage, i.e. what is it costing to deliver these services versus what you're charging. And we're getting better over time now in terms of really understanding that, that, that leakage from gross to net. Um, and it, it, it follows the same vein. Student PBSA led the way and, and effectively, as you're seeing now, operators are coming from the PBSA sector or hospitality sector they are moving into build to rent because they understand these service driven models and this operational um, component, which, which is key to the success of these schemes. It's no longer a case of build and they will come. Yes, there's a demand supply and balance that we're all aware of and it's very acute, but ultimately you've got to build the right product in the right place with the right services at the right price point. Yeah. That's sounds, very... sim sounds simple. No, it's, 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 it's Sorry, Darren, you want to say? I was just going to say, the only other thing I was going to say to that as well is, and I guess, you know, not to bring the doom and gloom to the conversation, being the, the one person who works for the bank on the panel, um, yeah, there is still a lot of uncertainty in the macroeconomic environment right now. And I think that, you know, whilst we want to underwrite and we still want to do deals, and we've evidenced that by doing a number of deals in the build to rent space this year alone, um, yeah. All of those sensitivities weigh into our thinking when we're coming up with you know how we can pitch leverage at the right level, how we can pitch pricing at the right level, you know, with the capital constraints that we're under and the regime that we operate within. Um, so yeah, if we're headed towards you know, unemployment yesterday crept up to 4.5%, that sort of GFC level, we think there's probably still some room to go in that. You know, who within the economy is going to be, you know, that's the type of thinking that we then need to start doing. Who in the economy is going to be impacted by that? What industries are going to be impacted by that? If it's, for example, financial services, does London, do you need to reflect that in the underwrites for the rents that you're putting in for London? So I think, you know, all of that sentiment of right product, right price, um, right, right 
area is going to become that much more important with this uncertainty that we're all facing, at least through the next sort of year um, and a bit. And I guess um, faced with uncertainty, um, based on my limited experience of a pandemic, is that uh, is it, it's when people look for more information because that is the basis of some sort of decision making for certainty. So fantastic, we've all of a sudden come up with this build to rent hub uh, that might help in that regard. Um, but also, um, just a bit of a plug, is that the BPF and the UKA and other industry bodies are also working on some benchmarking um, uh, and on a bench, benchmarking project because we believe as a sector that will also help in terms of understanding information um, and certainty of certain performance metrics, which will no doubt um, help with investment cases. But on that note, um, I was, you know, just going back to that B2B to B2C, obviously the, the consumer pays all of our bills. So Peter, I'm curious about, you know, your views um, and actually everybody's views because we don't have a lot of time and there's a couple of questions in there is so far we've built a really successful sector from investment to end user experience which is on the up and up seemingly I'm curious about all of it for each of you what's necessary to take it further and you know Peter from how do we get from the B2B into the B2C better and how do we educate that consumer about the proposition to basically prove the numbers that the in infant numbers that we've been getting across the sector and and build something brighter i think one thing we need is a bit more of a a big seat in central government to Ooh, enter mark to hmm? enter mark. Just, 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 yeah just to help um push it we've we've been an advocate of minister for renting um i think while Barrow and bucket loads of money gets shoveled into the ownership market. It just feels as though the bill to rent side is still um, the sort of Cinderella, and it, it could be it could have a higher profile, and that would help enormously. We most people who come and have a look at, at the products are very impressed. My um, stepdaughter and her other half have just taken a flat in Stratford. Um, and they were just blown away by the quality of that build. And that build is coming through. It doesn't have to be massively expensive. It's been commented before. We don't necessarily need the gym. We don't necessarily need the capital, ex you know, front end capital cost amenities. But the, the cafe, the open spaces, the co-working, not massively expensive. Um, these are the little things that the customer seems to attach themselves to. And that's what's coming through quite strongly in our data, especially over the COVID period. It's that community feeling. Uh, right. And I think that's what, the combination of that and would, would help us tremendously. So there's so many things to unpack in that. Um, so first of all, you, you said the uh, Ministry of Renting. And so my, my question about that is that, is it really the government that is restricting our ability to get out to consumers? Or is it there that there maybe is a stigma still around renting being second? Yeah, I think so. I think we, well, we are the Englishman, same as Castle. We're owner obsessed. We have been since the war. And uh, one of the reasons we're talking about this industry is because the one that I've grown up with and most of us have grown up with is probably a bus model. Um, certainly, if it requires wheelbarrow loads of money and tax breaks and incentives to keep it going, you just question how long that's got to go. And, um, you know, so we're in this, and I, I don't think affordability or access to ownership or not access to ownership is a reason why built to rent is so appealing now. There are lots of other lifestyle choices that go towards this. And when you're in a practically zero inflation, and zero interest rates, um, you know, you're, that, that's combined with the problems that we just talked about employment wise. This way of living is very appealing, but I think it would help if there was something more within central government. And uh, that, that's love to rent has put its hand up for a minister for rent from day one. And Excellent. Mark, how do you feel about a promotion? So, I mean, I think, first of all, um, it is true that uh, the government sets a lot of store by owner occupation. Uh, there's no 
that you know they talk about the dream of home ownership and it would be wrong to pretend that that isn't important to to the prime minister and to our own ministers um and you know they the, there are various statistics that show that an awfully high proportion of the population um value home ownership i mean i mean so i think you have to go beyond that a bit and recognize that even even where home ownership uh, a high premium is placed on that um, an awful lot of people are going to live in the rented sector for some period of their life and actually we need to make that experience as good as possible um, and and certainly not stigmatized um, so part of government's contribution to that actually is just to make living in the PRS at large better and um, you know we've seen a series of reforms in the rental market proposed um, series of policies aimed at the, at, at the other end of the PRS from from build to rent uh, the, the the bad landlords um, and 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 you know I think to an extent that taking action on that end of the market can help despect destigmatized living in the PRS too but I um, you know it, it, it's it's um, for the for variety of reasons I think the government wants to see the build to rent sector flourish and that includes the lived experience of people living in the in the sector either because they choose to permanently or because own owner occupation isn't for them right here right now um, and um, you know we may not spend a huge amount of time screaming from the rooftops about that, but that that doesn't mean we are trying to not trying to um, make the lived experience of living in the PRS better at all ends of the market at all price points, and and hopefully that will will remove the the de, you know destigmatize it, even while owner occupation remain remains an important priority for many people. Thanks, Mark. I think one of the important things you raised there was around standards. And um, I think everybody on this panel and certainly in the sector would encourages higher standards um, and uh, to to make sure that it mitigates risk. It lifts the profile of uh, the product of the experience. It means that we keep our people safe. It means that we lift the reputation of the sector. It invites more um, industry um, um, uh, investment when there's um, uh, it's got a higher profile and less risk and so from that perspective and, and Roper was one of those things um, Marcus and, and as somebody on the notes uh, chat just um, mentioned um, but Mark uh, sorry Joe going to you about um, what what in your view do you think is necessary to take the sector further in terms of you know a brighter build to rent future Sorry, did you say me? No, sorry, Mark. I mis 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 misquoted huh? me. I meant Joe. Sorry. Mark. I think from my from my perspective, I I liken the built to rent sector to the early days of PBSA, purpose built student accommodation. I think there's an education, not not purely from a, a stigma point of view, as Mark outlined, but also just an education point of view of what is it? Because this country is so used to traditional HMO or old school traditional PRS living. This is this is a new product, albeit it's been around for a decade, but it's it's a new type of product that not everyone has seen. We've seen by the numbers, you know, it's it, it will take a while to uh, to spread across the entire country. So it, it's a new product. People need to be educated on what it what it actually is. How can it benefit them? What are you bringing to the table that's different to the current offering? How does that benefit them? Can they live there for a sustained period of time uh, and be persuaded that it's not just a, a short term gap whilst they find something more permanent? Um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about all inclusive rates, which was just never heard of prior to PBSA. And actually, oh, when I do the sums and I calculate what I would be buying from a, you know, a, a two up, two down or renting in a two up, two down with some friends, once you start coupling on all those additional services such as broadband, utilities, et cetera, the, the premium on B to rent, uh, on build to rent isn't as great as you would think. 
Um, and, and in some cases, it's a misnomer. In some cases, it's actually cheaper than the, the, the private rental sector. So I think for me, the education piece is key. And, you know, if the hub can help in that respect, then, um, you know, we're certainly positive for that because I think it is a product that's, that's here to stay. And there, it, there are a lot of people that will enjoy living in these types of schemes. And we've seen already the uptake in, you know, how, how Stratford and Wembley have just grown exponentially. Uh, and obviously Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, Leeds, these other cities that are also growing. There, there is definitely a place for it in the market, but do enough people know? Now, we know the younger generation who are used to PVSA will have lived in these types of schemes. So it almost feels like a natural progression for them to, on their life stage journey, to progress into, into BTR if they're not looking for or can't afford home ownership at this stage. But there's a lot of other renters out there that don't even know this product exists. So I think it's, um, it's get, for, getting it out there. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, so in terms of this sort of awareness campaign, if you like, or uh, raising this, the, the profile of field to rent, who, who do you think should take the leading role on that? Is it individual investors like yourself? Is it the sector as a whole? Is it government? Is it? I think it's a combination. Um, and I would say that, but I think we've, we've all got to rally together. Um, you know, a united front is, is far stronger than individuals. And, you know, that's where Ian has been very good with his, his work outside of, of BTR and other areas in terms of championing. Uh, you touched on, you know, a, a code of practice or a code of conduct that makes the the, um, the sector investable and, and gives more comfort. Um, you know, I think what, that's why I referred to looking back to PBSA because that's how that started. That sector started in the same vein and it was, it was um, developers and investors getting together with universities and then suddenly, um, you know, lobbying governments, et cetera. And, and I think, you know, that that's, that's a path well trodden that, that has borne fruit. So it, why can't it do the Quite same right. for BTR? I think one of the greater challenges with with build to rent versus student is student is a is a segment of a journey of someone's life. Typically, uh, build to rent covers everything. To Mark's point about from you know from lower rents right through to premium and everything in between, and and even the definition of build to rent and what it constitutes is often a topic of hot debate in the sector. So, Darren, we've got a couple of minutes left. What do you think? Uh, is necessary to take the sector further to build a brighter future for built to rent. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I, you know, going back to some of what Mark was saying, I I don't think you know we as a group should be under any illusion. You know, in terms of the Conservative Party or the government that we're under, they're a party of home ownership, so they they focus on that in terms of you know being a, or using that as a tool to become elected. I do think, though, that you know, general market forces have have led to BTR evolving in itself. So whether it's where record low interest rates are, you know, where sponsor money is in terms of being able to deploy cash to go and you know, diversify their their, their um, risk base, I think all of those have led to you know 172,000 units in the pipeline right now. I think you know, some of the softer things that we do need to do as an industry, I think are being led by groups like Crefkey, the BPF, UKAA. And we need to just continue along those veins to really you know, accelerate. But you know, do I think this group or this industry is in, or the subsector, sorry, is any real um, cause for distress or you know, schemes not being able to, to get the green light? I, I, I don't think so. I think you know, the sector's in a, in a pretty healthy place. I do admit we probably need to do a bit more work to get some more money out there. Um, so, you know, we'll continue doing that this year and hopefully we'll be able to, to, to support more investors like Joe in the future. Fantastic. I tend to agree with all of you on all of those points. It's just a matter of getting ourselves across all of it. So I think we can officially say that the Build to Rent Hub is open, launched. Congratulations to everyone. Welcome to the hub. And we hope that, yeah, go be. <laughs> um, two minutes to go. Um, I Oh, there's a message there from James Partager. Hello, James. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Um, and it, oh, the message is essentially very simple. Renters deserve better. And uh, you've, you've written to the rest of the panelists, but that is essentially a very good message, which I'm going to leave us on. Um, I'd like to thank Property Alliance, Industry Alliance, 
BPF for hosting UKA um, and CREFC and, and BPF for contributing to the hub and making it happen. Very, very um, happy day in the sector for us to share more information and collaborate. I'd like to thank the panelists. Lovely to have you on and see you all. Mark, we see you again. Um, Darren, Peter, Joe, and of course, Ian. And on that note, I like to keep things to time. So lovely to see you all. Thank you very much and hope to see you in person very time soon.